First, it was Nintendo. Then, it was Capcom. But now, it's Bandai Namco. Alright, never mind. Guess it's Sega. So in my ongoing series where I take a look at the current state of every franchise for different companies, we've arrived at what may be the hardest company to rate, mainly due to the fact that Sega loves selling and buying the rights to certain franchises. Do I count franchises that started with Sega but are now owned by 2K Sports for example? What about Atlas games that were released before Sega acquired them in 2013? Now I had to think long and hard about this, but hear me out. If Sega owns it as of the current day, then it's included. I know, peak critical thinking. Anyway. The controversial tier list, if you want to call it that, returns. And if you're wondering why certain tiers are thicker than others, uh, well, actually, don't worry about that. I will say though, that if you're already in a sad mood, maybe come back to this video another time. Now only franchises that include more than one game will be included, and they must have been released in the West at some point. I'll also preface this and say that due to the length of the original video, I had to split it into two parts, as my dodgy computer couldn't handle exporting it as one. But with all of that boring stuff out of the way, let's find out once and for all, the current state of every single Sega franchise. So let me ask you guys something. What do you think was the very first Sega franchise? For those of you saying Sonic, uh, you're kind of close, you're only off by about 12 years or so. But to figure out what could be considered the very first franchise, we have to take a look at how Sega first came to be. Now would you believe me if I told you that the earliest traces of Sega could be linked back to one of the Great Wars? Let me explain. Back in the 1930s, there was a businessman going by the name Irving Bromberg, who had established himself as a major player in the coin-op distribution. With the onset of World War II and the increase in military personnel, the businessman figured that stationed soldiers would need some kind of entertainment during the leisure time. Regardless, following the outlawing of slot machines in the US territories, Bromley sent two of his employees over to Tokyo in 1952, where the company became known as Service Games of Japan. The name Sega, which was actually just an abbreviation of Service Games, would first appear two years later in 1954 on the Diamond Star Machine. By 1965, Sega had merged with Rosen Enterprises to form Sega Enterprises, while also transitioning from an importer of games to a manufacturer of them. This was the first instance that led Sega to start developing their own games. By the end of that same year, Sega had released their very first electromechanical game, Periscope. Now Periscope was an arcade shooting submarine simulator that had you attacking warships on a backdrop representing the ocean. Warships would dangle from chains and move horizontally, and it was up to the player looking through the periscope to direct and fire torpedoes at them. The game was revolutionary and featured innovative light and sound effects, which helped it garner success in Japan before being exported over to the west. This gassed Sega up, and within the coming years they would pump out game after game. None of these games ever evolved into franchises though, and this continued for over a decade, until the release of Monaco GP in 1979. Monaco GP was a racing game where you didn't race. Wait, what? No, see, instead of racing other players and trying to finish first, the idea was to instead finish the course before time ran out. So I guess you could say you were still racing, but it was just against time. As the game progressed, rival cars would get faster, the roads would get more narrow, and the surface would change to things like ice and gravel. Various hazards would appear on the track, such as puddles and tunnels, which limited the player's vision. The game found decent success in Japan, but would skyrocket upon reaching the United States, where it became the top grossing driving game of 1981. This would result in a further two sequels, Super Monaco GP in 1989, and finally Ariton Senna's Super Monaco GP 2 in 1992. Super Monaco GP in particular went on to garner incredible success, whereas Super Monaco GP 2, while positively received, was criticised for showing too many similarities with its predecessors. Following Super Monaco GP 2, the franchise would see no further releases, meaning unless Sega has been working on the next game for over 30 years, it's most likely a dead franchise. Now when you think of Sega, the majority would think of a certain hedgehog. But what if I told you that Sega got started with a penguin? Released in 1982 for arcades, Pango had players control Pango, a red penguin who found himself stuck in an ice maze. The game made use of a four position joystick, as well as a singular button. This button was used to press up against ice blocks and slide them across the maze. Now you may be thinking, well alright, this seems to be the easiest maze ever if you could just push blocks out of the way and form your own escape path. But while it was technically a maze, the goal wasn't to escape it. Instead, there were these little eggs that hatched into snow bees, and it was up to Pengo to crush them with the ice blocks. If you're wondering why Pengo is red, it's because he's squashed so many bees that he's now covered in their blood. Okay, no, I made that part up, but I mean, come on, wh why is he red? 
Regardless, Pengo would do decently well and find himself in his own sequel called Pepenga Pengo, which was released in 1995 on the Sega Mega Drive exclusively in Japan. Unfortunately, that's where this cute little penguin story ends, pushed away like an ice block into the dead category. Alright, let's go. Wait, huh? Let me move. Alright. Yeah, so the next game released was Sega's Zaxxon. This game in particular was the first to employ axonometric projection, which helped stimulate 3D objects from a third person viewpoint. Zaxxon was also the first arcade game to ever be advertised on television, with a commercial produced by Paramount Pictures for over $150,000. With the use of a four-direction joystick, players were tasked with flying through two heavily defended space fortresses, with an outer space segment between them. So apart from dodging what appears to be brick walls uh, in space, players would be required to shoot down turrets, other ships, and fuel tanks which replenished the ship's fuel. Saxon would go on to find major commercial success, becoming one of the highest grossing arcade games of 1982. Sega was so confident in this franchise, I mean they did drop 150k on a commercial, that by the end of that same year, they had already released a sequel called Super Saxon, which was really just Saxon 1.5, except with slightly different colours, a faster ship, and the space segment being switched out for a tunnel. 1987 would see the release of Zaxxon 3D, where you were forced to wear those flimsy ass 3D glasses, and most recently in 2012, Zaxxon Escape would be released for the iOS and Android. The latest game was heavily criticised for having little resemblance to the original, and I can see why. Okay, never mind. Maybe this is Zaxxon, because I can't seem to get past the first 15 seconds of any of these games without hitting a bloody wall. Anyway, I'm going to say this is a zombie franchise at best, as we haven't seen a new iteration in over a decade. Now we've arrived at our first franchise that wasn't originally a Sega franchise. Thunder Force was a series of free roaming scroller shooter games initially developed by Technosoft and published by Sega. The series would see six mainline installments, from the original Thunder Force in 1983 for personal computers to Thunder Force 6 released for the PlayStation 2 in 2008. Out of the six games created, Sega only developed one of them, and funnily enough, that just happened to be the latest game, which not only got heavily criticised for its blurry visuals, short length, and recycled stages, but was also the last game released for the franchise as a whole. Now I'm not saying Sega took a flourishing franchise and killed it, but... Okay, may maybe I am saying that. Unfortunately, what started as a unique little free roaming shooter has most likely seen its last days. It seems as though Sega had a strange obsession with penguins early on, as 1985 saw the release of Doki Doki Penguin Land. The game which shares an uncanny resemblance to Pengo had players guide an egg from the top of the screen to the bottom. The goal was to dig downwards carefully, as to not smash the egg when dropping it down. While the original game never saw play outside of Japan, it was considered a classic by Sega, and saw two sequels released in the form of Penguin Land, which did happen to release in the West, and Doki Doki Penguin Land MD. While all games featured similar gameplay, the Western release would depart from the classic story of delivering an egg to your penguin girlfriend, to now having Overbite, which was the game's protagonist, leading an interplanetary mission where he had to deliver eggs to his crew, which were hiding out in a space station beneath the surface of the planet. If this was an attempt to cater to a more Western audience, then I have to say, they absolutely nailed it. That sounds so dumb that I can't help but love it. Unfortunately, just like Pengo, it seems as though Sega has shifted their interests onto other anime archetypes, leaving Doki Doki Penguin Land in the dead category. Hang on, what was the next franchise that came out? <laughs> Get it? Alright, I apologise for that. But yes, the fittingly named Hang On was the next franchise released in arcades in 1985. The game could be played on an upright arcade machine, or if you're all about the immersion, you could saddle up on the ride-on cabinet, which was quite innovative for its time, as it realistically simulated a motorcycle. These are commonplace these days in arcades, but you have to remember that this was over 30 years ago, and I can only imagine what people were thinking when tilting side to side zooming around digital race courses. As was the case with a lot of these old Sega franchises, the game would explode in popularity, to the point where they had to start modifying the coin mechanism to accept higher value coins, due to the sheer number being shoved into the machine. The franchise would see the release of two further sequels, the immensely popular Super Hang-On and the not-so-popular Hang-On GP, and that's where the franchise has been left to this day, with no new releases since Hang-On GP in 1996, and I think you're probably starting to get the idea of why certain tiers in this list are thicker than others. So I want to pass this one over to you guys. What do you guys think is the goal of this franchise? Well, if you said you played as a dude with a jetpack that flew around with a laser shooting anything from prehistoric animals to Chinese dragons, flying robots, and alien pods, then I, then I guess you won. Um, I mean, I don't really have a prize because if I'm being honest, I didn't think anyone would guess right.
Space Harry was a third person arcade rail shooter released for arcades in 1985. As you can tell from my description, was definitely out there in terms of creativity. In this game still garners praise for its visual impact, solid gameplay and classic tunes, and it's not hard to see why it became so successful. The game would spawn three sequels, the first of which being Space Harry 3D, once again utilising those god awful 3D glasses. Space Harrier 2 would release in 1989, only to be followed by Planet Harriers in 2000. Unfortunately, by this point, the arcade scene was on the decline, and outside of a re-release of the original Space Harrier for the Switch, this franchise has joined its prehistoric enemies. Now, after messing around with on-rail shooters, races, and penguins, Sega wanted to take a shot at platformers. Wonder Boy would be released in arcades in 1986, and followed the titular character Wonder Boy, as he ventured through seven areas in an attempt to rescue his girlfriend, who had been captured by the Dark King. Sounds normal so far, right? Well, Wonder Boy himself was actually a tribal caveman, that had the ability to throw stone hatchets at enemies, but he also rode skateboards that could be found in eggs? The game, like many of Sega's at the time, went on to gain considerable success in arcades, before being ported over to numerous home consoles. It would also establish the long-running Wonder Boy series, which included a further five sequels up until Monster World 4 in 1994 for the Mega Drive. And while initially a Japanese exclusive, by 2012 an English language version would release digitally on all consoles. Furthermore, a remake of Monster Hunter 4 would be developed by Art Dink, now titled Wonder Boy Ash and Monster World, which would release in May of 2021. Due to this recent remake not doing too hot though, I think it's more than likely in the life support tier. So the creation of the cute em up genre, which is pretty much just shoot em up but with cute stuff, and yes, before you ask, that, that is a genre that exists, is often credited to Fantasy Zone, the next franchise on this list. Fantasy Zone follows Oppa Oppa, as he used his bullets and bombs to destroy enemy bases. Players could upgrade his weapons as well as increase his speed throughout each stage, and these stages would often end in a boss battle, leading to Fantasy Zone actually popularizing the boss rush mode in which the player was tasked with facing multiple bosses in quick succession. Some have referred to Oppa Oppa as Sega's first mascot, but judging by the little guy's lack of a face, or any real identifiable features, I can see why they eventually had him replaced. Even so, the game was quite successful in Japan, leading to a multitude of sequels. Two of these made their way to the West in Fantasy Zone 2, The Tears of Oppa Oppa, and Super Fantasy Zone in 1992. A further two games would follow, neither of which made it out of Japan, meaning we once again have a dead franchise on our hands. Now if you thought One Punch Man was strong, wait till you see this next franchise. Alex Kidd was first released in 1986 for the Master System. The player assumes the role of Alex, known to be one of Sega's earliest mascots, who must traverse levels while demolishing enemies and rocks in an attempt to collect money that could be used to purchase vehicles like motorbikes or helicopters. The game was notoriously hard for its time, as Alex had seemingly put all of his stat points into attack, and none into defense. The game also featured no save system, which may sound brutal, but there was a secret method around this, in which you could restart the level by paying with in-game currency. Alex Kidd would receive critical acclaim upon its release, and over the next four years would see an additional four games added to the franchise. Following the release of Alex Kidd in Shinobi World in 1990, the franchise was seemingly dying out despite its growing fanbase. In what can only be described as a miracle however, Merge Games would revive the series with its remake of the original game titled Alex Kidd in Miracle World DX, which also released for all major consoles in 2021. Because of this, it is my great honour to announce that we finally have a Sega franchise not sitting at the bottom, however I don't believe it's consistent enough to move past the it exists here. Now Sega would follow up Alex Kidd with another breakout success in Outrun. Designed almost single-handedly by Yu Suzuki, the premier 3D driving game had players racing around different environments in their very own Ferrari. It was well known for its pioneering hardware, graphics, and non-linear gameplay, which allowed players to take different routes, with each representing separate difficulty levels. The game was a critical success, not only becoming the highest grossing arcade game of 1987, but also Sega's most successful cabinet of the 1980s. A further three arcade sequels were released, as well as several non-arcade sequels, with the latest Outrun 2006, Coast to Coast, being released for PS2, Windows and Xbox in 2006. Well, duh. Despite the series not having a new entry since, its name has been adopted as a substitute name for the synthwave music genre, as well as being used for albums. Because of this lasting interest, I think it's plausible to put it in the zombie tier, as there's a slight chance that it may come back. Speaking of zombies, Sega would use them as an inspiration when drawing up the fly for this next franchise. What the fuck is that? Well not actually, but Alien Syndrome was a horror game disguised as a running gun shooter, and no one can convince me otherwise. I mean, look at some of these boss designs. Yeah, 
You're welcome for the nightmares. The gameplay would allow up to two players to control two soldiers, who were tasked with fighting their way through levels while rescuing their comrades who were being held by aliens. It was praised for its horrific atmosphere, chilling sounds, and special effects, and went on to become one of the most successful table arcade units of the month. Alongside an upgrade for the PS2 using polygonal graphics, the franchise would get a sequel of the same name, which was released for the Wii and PSP in 2007. Unfortunately, the sequel was but a mere shell of the original, with poor enemy variety, lazy level design, and lackluster visuals. Due to the low ratings and poor sales, it's most likely been shelved by Sega, with little to no chance of being revived. Not to worry though, as the next franchise was ahead of its time. I'm talking about Afterburner, a rail shooter arcade video game released in 1987. The player was left to control what simulated an American F-14 Tomcat fighter jet. For maximum immersion, the arcade game used a motion simulator arcade cabinet, one that came with flight stick controls and was capable of tilting, rolling, and rotating the cockpit in sync with the on-screen action. Legend has it that this game was so realistic, they implemented a seatbelt on the chair to stop players from spinning out. And while there may be no sources to back up those statements, I'd like to believe that's just how epic this game was. After becoming the second highest grossing arcade game of 1987, Sega once again wasted no time and within the same year, released a sequel called Afterburner 2. Like with Zaxxon however, this was pretty much just an enhanced version of the original game. This didn't stop it from becoming the highest grossing arcade game of 1988 however, and due to this immense success, the franchise would see the release of a further 4 games, with the most recent being Afterburner Black Falcon, released for the PSP in 2007. Afterburner 2 has been re-released over the years, but no new games has derived from the series since Black Falcon, unfortunately making it yet another dead Sega franchise. Nanjiro We've now arrived at the first flagship franchise that wasn't originally owned by Sega. Shin Megami Tensei is a Japanese media franchise developed and published by Atlas before being acquired by Sega in 2013. The series debuted with Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei, a first person dungeon crawler with turn based random encounters in which players controlled a party of two humans and a number of demons. The game would allow players to essentially gaslight demons into joining the party in exchange for items and money. The idea would go on to become the core mechanic used in Megami Tensei games, as well as its spin-off series. This mixture of demon negotiation and recruitment, paired with the traditional RPG elements, was considered revolutionary for its time, and the game saw immense success upon its release. The game would go on to get its own sequel in Devil Story Megami Tensei 2, which once again garnered critical acclaim upon release, and showed that Atlas had something truly special on its hands. Atlas would then remake the first two games under the new umbrella title Shin Megami Tensei, which has now expanded to include seven mainline games among multiple spin-offs. Each new entry would expand on the last, while still drawing from the core concepts set up by the original games. The immense success and popularity of the franchise have led to it being represented in other forms of media, such as anime and manga adaptions. While there are no sales figures for the earliest games, the latest entries into the franchise have all broken 500,000, with the most recent Shin Megami Tensei 5 selling well over 1 million units worldwide. It is without a doubt Atlas's flagship franchise, and as a byproduct, has become one of Sega's flagship franchises. The franchise was so popular that multiple spin off series have been developed from it, the first of which was the Devil Summoner series. Devil Summoner would release in 1995 for the Sega Saturn, and despite being a spin off series, would take place in an alternative modern Earth where people known as Devil Summoners would form contracts with demons using devices called Zero MPs. The games would still incorporate a traditional turn based combat system, with players taking part in battles while navigating an overworld and multiple dungeons. The subseries has expanded to include 5 games, with the most recent being Soul Hackers 2 released in 2022. Soul Hackers 2 would go on to receive mixed reception though, with many engaging with the story and characters but feeling let down by the uninspired level design. Sega would later reveal that the game was struggling to meet sales expectations, but that it would like to continue to support the series in hope of its potential long term success. I think it deserves the it exists status for a subseries because of this. Now while Sega may be disappointed in the slow decline of this spin-off series, they wouldn't have to worry at all about their next one. Barely a year after the release of Devil Summoner, Atlas would release their next spin-off series, which in some cases would go on to become even more popular than the mainline franchise. That series was Persona. 
Revelations Persona would initially start as an RPG game in which players controlled a group of high school students as they navigated through town areas as well as dungeons. Battles would take place in grid-based arenas, with characters and enemies being able to move according to their specific locations. It would also introduce the concept of summoning personas, which reflected the multiple sides of each of the characters. Elements and characters such as the Velvet Room and Igor, which have become synonymous with the series, were also first introduced in this entry. Now while not a smash hit upon release, it did fare decently well, at least enough for it to make its way over to the West, where it quickly became a cult classic. Persona 2 Innocent Sin would release a few years later in 1999, and involved the many of the core features first displayed by its predecessor. While these earlier games were popular in Japan, it wasn't until the release of Persona 3 that the franchise would implement its most unique aspect resulting in the mainstream success of the series as a whole. Now while Persona 3 would continue with the high school setting, and its depiction and use of personas, the game would be the first to introduce elements that mimicked simulation games. The play would now progress day by day, through a typical school year in which they could form relationships with others and engage in Monday daily tasks to help increase their stats and strength of their personas. Now while this may sound boring as hell on paper, it was heavily praised and would actually go on to become one of Persona's defining factors, and its addition would be included and expanded on in future iterations. As of the current day, there have been 5 mainline games, among countless spin-off enhancements and ports. The latest in the series, Persona 5 in particular, was met with universal acclaim, with praise given to its immensely interactive world, charming characters and addictive gameplay. Persona 5 would go on to sell over 8.3 million units worldwide, becoming Atlas's most successful game, with the franchise as a whole selling over 16 million units, including spin-offs. Despite no mainline games being released in the last 7 years, the series has remained prominent with numerous spin-off games and enhancements released in recent years. It is without a doubt an Atlas flagship, and because of that, deserves a spot in Sega's flagships. We move from one smash hit to another, as Sega would debut one of their most popular series towards the end of 1987. The franchise in question is Fantasy Star, a series of RPG games that have consistently released over the last 35 years. The series can be divided into four sub-series, each taking place in their own little universe. The first four games in the series are set in the planetary system Algol and feature single-player gameplay centered around turn-based RPG combat. Starting with Fantasy Star Online, the series would turn more towards an online format, in which players could team up cooperatively with others to take on quests and to take on bosses. This format would continue with Fantasy Star Universe, which featured a more robust single-player story mode, alongside the persistent online network mode. The most recent subseries, Fantasy Star Online, which would release in Japan in 2012, had Western fans waiting until 2020 for a Western release. The game would receive a massive update with New Genesis in 2021, and like with previous games, gets frequent updates in the form of episodes that provide new stories, locations, and other content. As of the current day, Fantasy Star 2 has had over 10 million registered users. And while it doesn't have a particularly massive concurrent player base, it's definitely consistent. The franchise has received positive reviews across its many series, and is often regarded as a classic in the RPG genre. The franchise has seen an anime, manga, and books, and even a drama created from it. And as a result, I believe it deserves a spot in Sega's mainstays. Now following Fantasy Star, Sega would release Shinobi, a side-scrolling hack and slash game where players would control ninja Joe Masashi as he fought against Zed, an organization looking to kidnap the students of his clan. The gameplay followed your typical beat-em-ups, with Joe being able to attack, jump, and use ninjutsu, which was called ninja magic. Shinobi would go on to receive critical acclaim, as well as becoming the most successful arcade unit of the month and the highest grossing in America in 1998. The game is regarded as one of the most influential ninja games ever, and the one that kicked off the genre's longest running franchise. But if you thought that meant it was still being released to this day, then I'm sorry to disappoint you. From its initial release in 1987, the Shinobi franchise has seen 12 games to its name, ending with Shinobi for the Nintendo 3DS in 2011. As was the case with a lot of these long-running franchises, the reception towards these games slowly declined over the years, with the latest receiving mixed reviews and being criticised for its difficulty, which while common for the series was released in a period of time where, well, I mean, let's just be real. As gamers, we've gotten worse. What are you aiming at? What are you aiming at? The Shinobi franchise has sold over 4.6 million units across its games, and while Joe remains an iconic Sega mascot, the current state of his franchise has definitely seen better days. Now seeing the success of Shinobi, Sega saw the potential of farming the beat em up genre, as they would release Altered Beast barely 6 months later. Instead of a ninja though, Altered Beast would have you play as, well if you couldn't tell from the name, a hero chosen by god that could change into multiple magical beasts, like a wolf, a dragon, or a golden wolf. The game would feature multiplayer aspects that allowed two players to play at once, and they were tasked by Zeus himself to rescue his daughter Athena from Neph, the ruler of the underworld. Now while Shinobi was met with universal acclaim, Altered Beast 
was met with universal no claim because no one wanted to claim this game for what am I even saying? The game, while having an interesting concept, struggled due to its lack of innovation and clumsily drawn artwork and graphics. The game performed well enough to receive two sequels though, Altered Beast Guardian of the Realm for the Game Boy Advance in 2002, and more recently, Project Altered Beast, which never saw a release in North America, but was released in Japan and Europe in 2005. While the games have become a lost cause, there was talks of an animated project being announced back in 2016. Since then though, there's been no real news, which unfortunately means I have to place Altered Beast in the zombie tier. We now move on from beat-em-ups to strategy games with Herzog. Released for the top of the end computers, rocking GeForce RTX 1s in 1988, what was interesting about Herzog was that it acted as a prototype for its own sequel, Herzog's Way, which many consider as the first true real-time strategy game. Players would pilot a flying transforming mech that was used to purchase combat units which they could then airlift across the battlefield and issue commands to. Unfortunately, this game was never a huge commercial success, due to the lack of a marketing campaign and its relatively early release on the Genesis. While retrospective reviews of the franchise have always had positive things to say about it, that doesn't change the fact that due to the game's poor reception, it never got a chance to take off, and to this day remains a fairly unknown franchise. But while Herzog may have faded into obscurity, Sega's next franchise certainly wouldn't. That franchise was Golden Axe, a series of side-scrolling beat-em-up arcade games. Taking place in a medieval fantasy world, players would choose one of three heroes, tasked with recovering the legendary Golden Axe. The commercial success of the original would spawn a further four sequels and multiple spin-offs, with the most recent, Golden Axe Beast Rider, being released in 2008, and also marking the first time the series entered the 3D space. Even so, the game would still incorporate many of the series' elements, such as magic and riding beasts. The game was blasted on release though. Even IGN went on to say that this is a game worth avoiding like the plague, even if the classic remains deep and warm within your heart. Due to these poor reviews, the Golden Axe franchise has yet to see a new entry since. There was an attempt at a 3D reboot of the original alongside Streets of Rage and Altered Beast, undertaken by Sega Studios Australia, but this project would ultimately be cancelled after the studio closed down in 2013. In a weird turn of events, this cancelled prototype would actually see the light of day, when it was released as a limited one-day release on Steam on October 18, 2020. Apart from this though, and with no other news regarding the series, it's become another one of Sega's dead franchises. Now after witnessing the explosive success of Tetris in the late 1980s, Sega looked to try their own hand at puzzle games. The game they released as a result was Columns, a match 3 puzzle game released for arcades in 1990. The game would be positively received and sell decently well. Many sequels and spin-offs featuring some of the best names would follow. You got classics like Column 2, The Voyage Through Time, or Column 3, Revenge of the Columns, which sound like, they sound like movies, like honestly. The franchise saw its fair share of clones back in the day as well, but none of that really mattered, as the original series has not seen a new entry since Columns Deluxe, which released for iOS in 2008. No, this is not some illusion. Sega really did partner with Disney to have Mickey Mouse star in their latest franchise, known as Illusions. <laughs> Get it? Alright, a fun fact. In Japan, the Illusion series is known as I Love Mickey Mouse, which I think is pretty wholesome. Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse, which believe it or not is the actual title of the original game, was a platformer that released for the Mega Drive and Genesis in 1990. As was the case with pretty much any game released during this period, the game followed Mickey Mouse as he looked to rescue Minnie Mouse from the evil witch Miserabelle. With the use of an attack called Bounce and projectiles like marbles and apples, Mickey would work his way through different levels while defeating enemies and bosses. The extremely positive reception to the game would kickstart a whole franchise of games that would end with a remake of the original, released in 2013 for all modern consoles. In a similar sense, Donald Duck would get his own sequence of games from 1991 to 1993. And while not part of the main franchise, a new side-scrolling co-op platform game titled Disney Illusion Island is scheduled to release on the Nintendo Switch on July 28, 2023, lending well to the idea that this franchise may still have something left in the tank. Now we've arrived at Sega's premier tile matching series, Puyo Puyo. Over the course of 30 years, this series has released countless games, 27 to be exact, with some years seeing the release of multiple games at once. The general aim of the games is to defeat opponents by causing the side of the screen to become filled with Puyo, slime-like creatures that fall from the top of the screen in groups of 2, 3, or 4. Sega has gone on to state that the series has sold over 35 million copies. What? But due to the success and its relative consistency, I think the franchise actually deserves mainstay status. 
Now the next franchise on the list is a relatively obscure one, known as Rail Chase. This was an arcade light gun game, released all the way back in 1991, and had players riding in a mining car, while being chased by what appeared to be native warriors. One of the biggest aspects was the use of DX cabinets that tilted and rocked in accordance with the in-game action. Rail Chase 2 would release a few years later, and feature similar gameplay. What's really cool is that this series was, while not incredibly successful, actually had its own theme park ride, which was featured at Sega's flagship amusement theme parks in the 1990s. Unfortunately, both these rides and the franchise as a whole have seemingly been forgotten. The Shining is up next. Wait, no, not, not that one. I mean, Shining. Do, do you get what I'm saying now? The Shining franchise, and no, I'm not talking about the horror movies. Huh. Actually, you know what, maybe I am. All joking aside though, The Shining franchise is a series of RPG games that many consider to be the pioneer of Japanese console RPGs. Yes, even before the fabled Final Fantasy. Interestingly though, the battle scenes would actually be acted out by the in-game sprites, in a similar sense to a Fire Emblem. But if you thought Fire Emblem shout out games, then The Shining in comparison must have had diarrhea, as it would release a staggering 38 games, including remakes and enhanced ports, the latest of which being Shining Resonance Refrain, which was released in July of 2018. Now I know there was a fighting game spin-off series but well um, yeah well, let's not talk about that. Now despite its incredible output rate the large majority of these games have remained as Japanese exclusives and while fan translations exist I can't see the franchise being higher than mainstay but if there was one franchise to shoot Sega into stardom it would without a doubt be this next one. That's right, the one you've all been waiting for. The star of Sega, the Mario of Nintendo, the Mega Man of Capcom, the Pac-Man of Bandai Namco, the Solid Snake of Kana- Dude, we get it. No. Oh. Yeah, so I'm talking about Sonic. You can pat yourself on the back now for making it this far into this depressing video. Now, much like Mario, Sonic is kind of all over the place. Like, I get that he's fast, but seriously, Sonic's been in more games than I can be bothered to count. But from my sources, and not including remakes, ports, or mobile titles, it looks to be around 73 unique entries. I'm sure I don't have to state that this is an easy Sega flagship, even though I just did, but as Sega's main man, it's inevitable. The Speedy Hedgehog has participated in 2D platformers, 3D platformers, racing games, arcade games, mobile games, educational games, and even sports games, many of which are still being developed and released to this day. Marking itself as Sega's biggest franchise by a mile, with over 178 million software sales, 1.3 billion free-to-play mobile downloads, and countless other avenues like movies, merchandise, animations, and a thriving fandom, which has developed its fair share of fan art and fan games. It's without a doubt one of the biggest franchises in the world, and easily secures a spot atop the flagship tier. Now I feel inclined to rank and place the sub-series separately, but because Kai is my name and mediocre videos are my game, I'll just quickly run through where I would place each as a homage to the Hedgehog speed. The Sonic Riders series started off alright, but it quickly crashed into mediocrity following Sonic Freeriders which just completely sucked ass, and as a result we haven't had a new game since, dead tier. The Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing series only ever got two games, unless you include the 2019's Team Sonic Racing, and while these were fairly well received and sold decently well, were just inferior to Nintendo's Kart Racer Mario Kart. Despite this, Sega did release Team Sonic Racing, and while it was heavily criticised for being straight up worse than the Sega All-Stars games, it does show that resource are available to continue it, life support tier. Other races like Sonic R or the Drift and Rival games I would just group as other races, but all of these haven't seen a new entry in decades, so they're probably dead. Olympics I covered in my Nintendo video, so I won't redo it here. Sonic Boom games actually had a nice run during the mid-2010s, but unfortunately have not continued since 2016, life support tier. Education games, which I'm sure most of you probably didn't even realise existed, considering there were only three of them and they were all released during the mid-1990s dead tier. And finally the many sports games which haven't received a new edition in decades, unfortunately leaving them in the dead tier as well. As for the many one-off entries like Pinball Party or Sonic Shuffle, I would assume they were also all dead as they never really got their own direct sequels. Now following on from Sonic, and in a similar vein to Capcom's final fight, Sega would release Streets of Rage. Streets of Rage was your typical beat-em-up, and drew a lot of its aspects from Final Fight, like the ability to pick up items such as knives and glass bottles that were present around the landscape. Despite its likeness to Final Fight, upon its release the game was met with critical acclaim, with many calling it the best fighting game of all time, with its superb graphics, its huge number of attacks, and its funkadelic music, which was considered even better than Sonic the Hedgehogs. The game would top the charts and become one of Sega's 
Sega's best-selling titles, and unlike Capcom's Final Fight series, has continued into the current day with its most recent release, Streets of Rage 4, reviving the whole franchise which was seemingly dead back in 2020. Streets of Rage 4 in particular would sell incredibly well, shipping over 2.5 million copies. And for a genre as old as beat-em-ups, this was very impressive, and definitely set Sega up nicely if they were to continue the franchise. Because the franchise has already seen such a long hiatus, it's more than likely that it will happen again, and because of that I can't say that the Streets of Rage franchise can go any higher than the It Exists category, although some would say it's a mainstay. Now in case you were worrying about Sega losing its creativity, this next franchise would prove that they were still just as crazy as ever. Toe Jam & Earl was an action game that centred around, well, Toe Jam & Earl. The catch? They were alien rappers who had crash landed on Earth and had to collect parts of their wrecked spacecraft to escape. The game would feature a funky soundtrack and would often reference the urban culture during the 1990s. The game was said to take heavy inspiration from games like Rogue, and as a result would feature roguelike elements like randomly generated levels and items. Despite the game receiving very favourable reviews, it would be deemed a commercial failure by Sega. This wasn't the end of the franchise though, as the game built up its own cult following throughout the years. This resulted in a further three sequels being released, and in a similar fashion to Streets of Rage, the franchise had experienced a long hiatus before its most recent game, Toe Jam & Earl, Back in the Groove, reviving it with its release back in 2019. Now remember how I said that this game had its own cult following? Well apparently Stephen Curry was the leader of it, as on the 5th of December in 2022, a Toe Jam & Earl movie had been announced as in development from Amazon Studios, who were working with Stephen Curry and his production company, Unanimous Media. While this is cool and all, because of the long hiatus between its games, I don't believe the franchise could be any higher than it exists, but honestly it's more likely a life support franchise, given that the most recent game was pretty much just an enhanced remake of the original. Now the depression continues with this next franchise, Land Stalker. This action adventure game had players take on the role of a treasure hunter as they navigated through a 3D world solving puzzles and fighting enemies. The game was a major critical and commercial success, but while its planned sequel ended up being cancelled, I still thought it should be added as the series would have its own spin-off and Lady Stalker challenge from the past, as well as its main characters Nigel and Friday appearing in Climax Entertainment's Time Stalkers, an RPG that brought together many of Climax's characters from their series. Land Stalkers has been re-released several times on the Virtual Console, Steam, and most recently on the Sega Genesis Mini. A remake was also apparently in the works for the PSP during 2005, but unfortunately was also cancelled. At the end of the day, it joins the rest of the dead franchises. Now, does anyone remember the Asterix comics? You know, the series that follows Asterix and Obelix as they cause hell for the Roman invaders during their adventures? Following the immense success of this comic, the series would quickly migrate into plenty of other media formats, including game books, board games, and most importantly, video games. Now, Asterix has been passed around by plenty of publishers, such as Atari and Konami, but for the sake of this video, we will only be discussing the four games published by Sega first of which was the fittingly named Asterix, which was released in 1992 for arcades. The game was a typical side-scrolling platform game, in which Asterix and Obelix must navigate through each stage looking for a key that would be required to open the door at the end of it. The game was heavily praised for its similarities to the source material. The Asterix series would see a further three entries, released over the next three years until 1995. I'm guessing by this point that it either wasn't selling well, or Sega just gave up on the franchise because there hasn't been anything from them since. Interestingly, Asterix himself has seen numerous releases up to this day by other publishers like Atari Europe. In relation to Sega though, this is nothing more than another dead franchise. We go from comics to cartoons, as Sega would start its own series of games centering around Taz, from the cartoon series Tasmania. The first of several games was a 2D side-scrolling platform adventure game, first released in 1992 for the Mega Drive and Genesis. The game would feature a grand adventure where Taz, dazzled by the prospects of a massive omelette, would find himself adventuring through the lands in hopes of finding a giant egg laid by the giant seabirds. The game would actually become a bestseller in the UK for two months, with many critics praising it for its stunning visuals for its time. An official sequel titled Tasmania 2 was conceptualised but never made it past development. Not to worry though, as Taz would return in 1994 following the release of Taz and Escape from Mars. And while many considered it a step forward in comparison to its predecessor, it was also seemingly the last step Sega would take with the Looney Tunes Devil. So by now, Sega's tried their hand at Penguin Games, then they moved on to Hedgehog Games. Any guesses to what animal they tried next? I'll give you a hint, it starts with Dolph and ends with Finn. Ah, uh, why do I always do this? Anyway, the next franchise Sega would release was Echo the Dolphin. The player takes control of Echo, a bottlenose dolphin who travels through time, to combat extraterrestrials in Earth's oceans and on an alien spacecraft. Yeah, have I mentioned that Sega is some seriously whack ideas? Now if you ever want to test your skills as a game, then this is the game to play. Echo makes Sonic look like a snail, honestly. 
the tight underwater caves, the incredibly fast movements, especially when you ram into enemies, and the overall layout of the levels made the game incredibly hard. It was also somewhat unnerving, finding yourself alone in the depths of the ocean, but maybe that was just how I thought about it. The original would become a bestseller on the Sega Mega Drive, resulting in the production of a further four sequels, which were released over an eight year period until the year 2000, with Echo the Dolphin, Defender of the Future. A sequel titled Echo 2 Sentinels of the Universe was actually in production in 2001, but was ultimately cancelled following the decline of the Dreamcast. A playable build of this cancelled sequel surfaced online in 2016. Now while this franchise may look like a lost cause, there is actually some hope for a new entry. Following a settlement reached by series creator Ed Annunziata with Sega regarding legal rights to the franchise, Annunziata himself would go on to express interest in reviving the series on the Nintendo Switch, and because of that, I believe I can move it up to the zombie tier. We move into the year 1993 now, and Sega was making some big moves. I'm not sure if you've heard of this small movie series called Jurassic Park, but it was pretty much about this zoological park that showcased genetically engineered dinosaurs and how that caused it to all fall apart. Anyway, Sega wanted to give this small movie series a chance, and decided to lend them a hand by developing games in relation to the movies. The first, which took on the same name as the film, would release in 1993 for the Sega Genesis. The game was your standard side-scrolling action game, with basic platforming elements. The goal was to reach the end of the level, but what made this game so unique was the choice of playing as the titular character Dr. Alan Grant, or a Velociraptor. Now, I don't know about you guys, but who'd want to play as some lame paleontologist when you could play as a freaking raptor that could jump higher, run faster, and rip enemies apart? Well, maybe that's just my preference. Regardless, the game sold incredibly well, breaking records at the time and blessing fans with a further two sequels, the first of which being a rail shooter which took place in a cabinet that actually resembled the rear of the Ford Explorer tour vehicles from the film, and then the series would finish off with The Lost World Jurassic Park in 1997. But wait, did the series get a revival with the Jurassic World trilogy? <laughs> no, it's dead. Now if there was one genre that dominated the 90s, it would without a doubt be fighting games. Street Fighter 2 in particular helped pave the way for fighting game dominance in arcades during this period, and Sega saw this as an opportunity to release their very own fighting game franchise, the first of which being Virtua Fighter. Now Virtua Fighter would separate itself from your typical fighting games, being the very first arcade fighting game to feature fully 3D polygon graphics. It would go on to receive critical acclaim, becoming one of Sega's best-selling arcade games of all time. The series has exploded into a very successful franchise, with four mainline sequels and several spin-offs, and has become Sega's flagship fighting series. With its consistent releases that have continued to this day, and the immense success it's seen in arcades, I think it deserves a slot as a Sega flagship. And if you disagree, then, I mean, come on, you, have you not seen the state of their list so far? You have to give them something. Now I really hope no one's been taking shots for every dead franchise. Well if you have, you're probably not with us anymore anyway. <laughs> and if you're thinking of starting now, um, I would advise against it because the next franchise on the list is Gunstar Heroes. What's Gunstar Heroes I hear you asking? Exactly. But the game itself would follow a pair of characters known as the Gunstar, in a run and gun style as they blasted their way through enemies with fancy acrobatic maneuvers to boot. The game would receive very positive reviews, and cemented Treasure's place in gaming history. A long 12 years followed before the Gunstar Heroes franchise would get a sequel, in the form of Gunstar Super Heroes, which was released on the Game Boy Advance in 2005. The sequel too would go on to receive critical acclaim, with many granting it the best GBA game of E3 2005. Unfortunately, no one bought the game, and the series itself is pretty much died out since. It would release on Steam later in 2011, but apart from that, it's been radio silent. Interestingly enough, this next franchise started off as a spin-off from another Sega game called Bonanza Bros. The main characters from that game, Robo and Mobo, would feature in this new puzzle game in which players would compete in a series of timed minigames. Despite the game receiving mixed reviews, it would still spawn two sequels, first released in 1994 and then in 1995. That's really all there is to say about this series though, and its absence since means that it's yet another one of Sega's dead franchises. Now you know how I said that the 90s were dominated by fighting games? and that everyone was trying to get in on the action? Well apparently that also included Atlas. And while technically not a subsidiary at the time, them selling out later means that I have to include their fighting game franchise Power Instinct as well. Now there was only one goal when looking to release your very own fighting game during this period, and that was to not look like a Street Fighter 2 ripoff. You'd see games releasing with random ass characters or random ass movesets, but nothing would compare to Power Instinct. I mean look at this gameplay, I mean <laughs> what are those sounds? Is he, is he, is he sucking his face? Yeah. I honestly have no words. If anything, these absurd actions were what helped the series gain some traction, and I can't lie, I can certainly see why. 
Unfortunately, this series didn't survive the test of time, as the latest release dates date back to early 2009, with no news of a future entry. Now when researching for this video, it honestly amazes me how many series Sega has developed for established franchises that are already in other media, and this next franchise is certainly one of the biggest. Now if you thought Sega was done with fighting games, then think again, as Sega would release Eternal Champions, meaning that in 1993 alone, Sega had already released two different fighting game franchises. It's no wonder that they have so many dead ones. To help differentiate themselves from the competition, Sega wanted to make sure Eternal Champions was as unique as possible. But while something like Super Smash Bros carved out its own identity with its unique aspects and flourished because of it, Eternal Champions' unique aspects were instead met with a very mixed response. There was a heavier emphasis on the story, the characters came from a bunch of different time periods, which meant that some would carry weapons or even force fields, which were all very strange for the time. Despite the criticism, the game would still sell well, and even received a sequel and two spin-offs, the latest of which being Experts, a side-scrolling beat-em-up released in 1996 for the Genesis. In typical Sega fashion, however, the third game in the series would be cancelled during development, and no news has been heard since. I really do hope no one's taking shots for every dead franchise, and if you are, rest in peace brother, you will be remembered as a true legend. Wait, what's that? Another hit film series? Guess we gotta sweep in on that and make a few games out of it. That's what Sega must have been thinking following the success of the Alien franchise, as within a year they had already released Alien 3 The Gun, an arcade rail shooter based on the film of the same name. What was actually pretty cool though was this gun that the players used had been modelled off the M4A1 pulse rifle that it was seen in the films, so you could say that you were really there, fighting face huggers and soldiers. The arcade game would become the most successful upright arcade unit of the month, and while no direct sequel would follow, this wouldn't be Sega's last venture into this series. After what felt like centuries, Sega would drop one of the best survival horror games in recent years on us, with its release of Alien Isolation back in 2014. The game, which was once again based on the original film, this time set 15 years in the future, would emphasize stealth and survival horror gameplay. Players were equipped with a motion tracker and were incentivized to avoid and outsmart enemies rather than fight them. Should you find yourself forced into combat though, Amanda, the game's protagonist, had access to numerous weapons such as shotguns, bolt guns, and a flamethrower, which were all found throughout the course of the game. This iteration would receive generally favourable reviews and sell over 2 million copies. Sega would go on to say that these sales numbers were weak though, which I never understood. Even so, the possibility for a sequel was definitely explored, but was later shut down due to the large majority of the original team no longer working at Creative Assembly. I still believe there may be hope for a new entry, but with Sega, you never know. So for now, it's most likely a zombie tier. Now if you've ever been to an arcade, and more specifically had a go at the racing games available, you'll most likely recognise this next franchise. The Daytona series of racing games has to be one of the most recognisable and influential arcade races of all time. The first of several would release back in 1994, where it was already making use of its rendered 3D graphics and texture mapping. The game, while not a breakout hit upon its release, has stood the test of time, with its longevity far exceeding many of its competitors in the same genre. The series has seen multiple sequels and remakes over the years, and despite it seemingly dying out in the early 2000s, was recently resurrected directed with Daytona Championship USA or Daytona USA 3, which debuted in late 2016 as an arcade exclusive. The series as a whole has been extensively praised for its state-of-the-art graphics, sound design, and damage physics. And while it may not be the most consistent franchise out there, I still think it can slot into the It Exists tier for now mainly due to its longevity. Now after witnessing the success of Virtua Fighter, Sega wanted to expand the graphical style used in that game to more genres. Virtua Cop, a 1994 light gun shooter, was one of the many games birthed as a result. This was the case with Virtua Fighter when it was released. Virtua Cop became well known for being the first time 3D polygon graphics had been used in real time with texture mapping. And in case you didn't know, Sega made sure you did, as they would advertise the game as the world's first texture mapped polygon action game. Enemies would react differently depending on where they were shot, 
and the game would also be the first to not use bulletproof glass, as players were finally allowed to shoot through glass and watch it shatter. These additions were extremely impressive for the time, and the game would go on to influence later shooters such as Time Crisis, The House of the Dead, and even the cult classic GoldenEye 007. The positive reception received pushed Sega to develop a further two sequels in Virtual Cop 2 and Virtual Cop 3. Now despite the success of Virtual Cop 2, the lack of interest following Virtual Cop 3 most likely killed off any chance of a revival for this franchise. While a port of Virtual Cop 3 was initially planned for the Xbox, it was later cancelled due to the cost required in designing a light gun to be used specifically for this game on that console. World Series Baseball. It sounds like your typical old school sports game, right? But this inconspicuous title was, was actually part of what would one day become a titan of the sports gaming genre. If you remember at the start of this video, where I stated that some of Sega's older franchise had been sold off to other companies, well this is what I was talking about. I'm referring to 2K's acquisition of Virtual Concepts, the studio which is now heralded as the king of 2K sporting franchises. I know I said I most likely wouldn't include these, but I thought I might as well quickly run through them, just to give you guys an idea of how some of the most popular sporting games first came to be. And where better to start than with World Series Baseball, released all the way back in 1994 for the Sega Genesis. Now this wasn't by any means the first baseball game, but it definitely was a major improvement over the earlier ones. It would be the first game to include licensed MLB players and teams, and for its time featured relatively accurate gameplay. As is the case even today with sports games, a new year meant a new entry, and the World Series Baseball franchise would continue until 2K3 in, you guessed it, 2003, where Sega would strike a deal with 2K Games to sell a visual concepts and the IP of the 2K Sports series for a measly 24 million. And yes, I know 20 years ago that probably sounded like a lot, but I mean, looking at it now, it just looks like daylight robbery. The next sport that Sega tackled was NFL, with the release of NFL Football 95 starring Joe Montana. Can you imagine if they kept that naming convention? NBA Basketball 23 starring Nikolai Jokic. Actually, you know what? Maybe Sega was onto something. On a more serious note though, this wasn't actually the first Joe Montana game, which was actually released all the way back in 1991. The thing is, at the time, Sega didn't obtain any licenses from the NFL, so apart from Joe Montana, the rest of the players were actually just made up people. This is a weird series honestly, Sega signed a 1.5 million 5 year contract with Joe Montana, and had him featured in 5 games up until NFL 95. But this wasn't the end of the franchise, as Sega continued on, now featuring Dion Sanders instead. In July 1997, Joe Montana actually filed a 5 million dollar lawsuit against Sega, claiming that they had breached their license with them. But seeing as I can't find anything more than that, I'm just going to assume that it didn't really go anywhere. NFL then led into the NFL 2K series, which Sega continued until NFL 2K5, before 2K Sports would take over. A similar story can be said about Sega's NHL ice hockey series. No cool lawsuits to mention this time though, as the series continued in a similar fashion until NHL 2K5, once again with 2K Sports taking over. Now let's talk about the big dog. Yes, that's right, I'm talking about NBA 2K series, which actually started with Sega believe it or not, all the way back in 1999 with the first NBA 2K on the Dreamcast. Unlike the NFL, Sega did have licensing rights to use real players and thus begun the norm for updated NBA seasons of players and teams. I bet Sega is kicking themselves for letting this one go. But alas, by the end of 2003, and following the release of NBA 2K5, this series was also lost to 2K Sports. Now, the next sports game series never did get picked up by 2K, most likely because college football's national championship was just considered a mere clone of the Joe Montana games, but with college teams instead of professional teams. The game even used the exact same engine and featured exhibition matches as well as a tournament mode. It would get a sequel titled College Football National Championship 2, which was released a year later in 1995. And finally, there was Sega Worldwide Soccer, a series of soccer games developed and released between 1995 and 2000. While these games often featured licensed teams, there wasn't too much setting them apart from other typical sporting games at the time, with many of the games in the series receiving mixed reception upon their release. With all of these sporting series, it's safe to say that they all belong in the dead tier for one reason or another. Now, do you remember the old Mighty Morphin Power Rangers show? Well, what if I told you that you could play the show as a game? because that's exactly what Sega tried to achieve with their release of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers for the Sega CD. Honestly, they were, they were really stretching it by calling this one a video game, as it essentially played back episodes of the TV series of the same name, but added what were early iterations of quick time events, which while they did nothing to change what was happening in the episodes, obviously, did take away from players' health bars and score that were kind of just slapped on the screen. 
Now while it may sound cool in theory, it looks as if you'd be split between paying attention to what was going on in the episode itself, while also waiting and focusing on random quick time events that show up. But maybe that's just me. This game did go on to become the top selling Sega CD after all. It must have struck a chord with some people. The series would go on to get its own spiritual successor called Mighty Morphin Power Ranger, the movie. And despite its name, these were actual video games. So let me get this straight. The first one, which is just the title of the show, was just the show with quick time events thrown in. But the one that clearly says the movie after it isn't actually a movie, but instead is a set of video games? <laughs> Someone make it make sense. The movie video games were actually a set of four different adaptions of the same film, each released on a different console. The Super NES got a side-scrolling action game, the Game Boy got something similar, the Game Gear got a competitive fighting game, and the Genesis would receive a side-scrolling beat-em-up, all of which would end up in the dead pile of Sega franchises, well at least the Genesis one would. Another month meant another racing series, and this time it was the Sega Rally franchise. What started in 1994 with the Sega Rally Championship quickly expanded into a series of five games, with the most recent, Sega Rally 3, being released in 2008. Apart from the series being the first to have players race on different terrains, which actually had an impact on the vehicle's handling, there's honestly not too much to say about it. With the latest entry never seeing a Japanese release, I can't say that it's likely we'll see a new installment anytime soon, if at all. But if there is one thing that's guaranteed to get a follow-up installment, it's this very video. Once again, I apologise for having to split this video in two, but apparently not even my PC can handle listening to the sad state of Sega for this long. Hopefully I'll see you guys all in the next video, where we'll lay to rest the remainder of Sega's extensive library.